Hello guys and girls, the program you are about to hear will be both fun and educational, but it is not a substitute for medical advice. Although we are doctors, we are not your doctors. Hello and welcome to Travel Medicine. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood internal medicine doc, Dr. J. And this is Praz the Sandman, making your wildest dreams come true for at least 45 to 50 minutes at a time. <laughs> I think you have a new one of those every time we <laughs> intro, which is great. So folks, welcome back to Travel Medicine. It's a new year, but... Before we ring in the bells by singing Old Lang Syne, we should bring back one of our amazing voice coaches and opera singers, which would be the lovely and talented Jessica Schneider. So, hello, Jess. Hello. How are you guys? Excellent. Welcome. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it has been forever since we had you on all the way back in our first season to talk about head and neck medicine. And oh, how yes. that affects singing. It was so long. It was before me. I know. I know. It's so nice to uh, sort of meet you, Pras. Sort of nice to sort of meet you, too. Well, the first time we had you on, we got to learn about a whole bunch of different vocal techniques we could use. Like, I believe, the Crack Babies and the Mrs. Doubtfires. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were talking a lot about the functions of the larynx as they relate to uh, the vibrations that you get sympathetically in your head when you create certain sounds and uh you know we had a lot of, well, we had a lot of fun with that didn't we <laughs> we we did and we had so much fun but we weren't able to cover everything we we did talk a little bit about the larynx and how the voice is formed but we left off a whole heap of things to talk about the voice so as most of us will be bundling up and may have recently finished caroling and drinking and wassailing and all those other holiday singing words mm -hmm. i figured it might be nice to come back in and talk a little bit more about the voice and our register and how our voices can shake burger and fry <laughs> yes there's a, there's so much i even have a little thing here about what happens if you can actually inadvertently injure yourself when you sneeze believe it or not huh. i can what really now? Well, how do we injure ourselves in sneezing Oh, yes. Well, I've, I've been reading this fantastic book. It's called The Odyssey of the Voice. It's by Dr. Jean Abitbol, who is a French otolaryngologist. And he's, he's written some wonderful things just about how the voice works, how it evolved over time, why human voices are so unique and special in relation to any other mammal on the planet. Mm -hmm. And he talks about vocal injuries and things that can affect your vocal cords such as uh, indigestion, pollution, colds, flu, etc. But he talks here a little bit about sneezing fits. He says they're bad news. And the reason is that uh, each sneeze can place the vocal cords under a lot of pressure. So when you sneeze, much like when you cough, the vocal cords can smack up against each other. And so the noise that you hear, the achoo, uh, the ah is the inhalation, but the choo is the actual sound of the vocal cords snapping against each other very violently, and it's also involuntary. Mm. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. Involuntary. Yes, I have a brain. That that end of that exhalation can actually cause a cordal hematoma if it's too violent. Mm. So, for example, if you have a massive sneezing fit, which this doctor does talk about, he had a patient who is prone to sneezing fits even though he does nasal irrigation, takes antihistamines, he's a typical hypochondriac singer, and apparently during one performance he had such a bad case of allergic rhinitis that he ended up in a massive sneezing fit which caused the audience to laugh. But what happened to him is he ended up with a slight hematoma on his vocal folds. Wow. Now... You're, what you're saying is a massive sneezing fit is actually causing your larynx to high-five itself? Pretty much, but very, very painfully, I would imagine. Hmm. Okay. And what what's considered a massive sneezing fit? Because I don't know about you, but I can get up to a good 6 to 10 in a row, especially with wow. the changes in weather around this time of year. I think my record's been three. That's, that's somewhat impressive, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, good. I certainly won't have nightmares about my vocal cords exploding. 
Well, I think there's also probably a perfect storm situation. I learned very recently that, well, it's not very recently, but I, I was reminded recently why you should not take a medicine like naproxen or ibuprofen before you have to sing. Oh, it's because of the bleeding risk. Yes, and so it appears that this person didn't quite know what his medication would end up doing to him, which is pretty common. You, you see it a lot in uh, singers that end up with with a, a hematoma or, or with some type of, of bleeding on the vocal cords. More often than not, it's a result of the perfect storm of medication that was wrong, something like a sneezing or coughing fit, or they're sick, or various reasons behind all of that. So I know a lot of people try to sniffle that their sneezes. Does that make things worse? It's funny, because this book actually doesn't say, and I don't know if it would make it worse or not. I think it's more of the actual expression. I guess if you really let out a very strong sneeze, I could see where that would bang your vocal cords together. I would assume that if you you wouldn't want to hold in a sneeze, but I, I would assume that if you didn't make such a huge noise, it probably wouldn't be that big a deal. Did you see that new article that was released that showed chimpanzees have the capability for vocal speech? Yes, I did see that. And that actually relates to something in this book, too, where he talks about the reasoning uh, behind that in the evolution of the voice. And... I was reading that the chimpanzees, while they have the physical capability, they do not have the mental capability. It has to do with brain development. So we could be hearing monkey voices, assuming evolution continues to progress. And I wonder what what their voices would sound like. Well, chimpanzees probably wouldn't. Their larynx is situated a little higher. What's interesting to note is that most mammals have a very, very high-placed larynx, which we do when we're born. Our larynx is actually up around our C2, C3 vertebra, and that allows us to breastfeed and breathe simultaneously, which is very handy when you have to eat and breathe simultaneously. Let's say you're in a mammal on the Serengeti and you go to the watering hole and you are eating or drinking and big predator comes up and you've got to run for it. Unlike a mammal in the Serengeti, we have evolved to such where we don't have that luxury. I wish we did. <laughs> What's interesting to note is that what happens over time, and I believe it happens over the first seven months of life in uh, human development, our larynx actually drops. And that's when it starts to go into place for our modern developed speech. And then it doesn't really solidify until we get to about age six or seven. So you'll hear the voice change a little bit in a kid. That's why, you know, you have the baby cry. And then toddlers, their voices are usually pitched a little higher. And then it usually evens out around six or seven. And then, of course, once we hit puberty, it changes again completely. And that's due to hormones and also more laryn laryngeal shift. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. And so it's something that's... Let's talk all about laryngeal shift because this week is dedicated to the voice. Now, usually I have a whole fun bit of history, but, you know, having having Jessica on is always such a delight. I don't even need to give you guys the history. We will leap right into this, and I will just start off by saying we as humans have four registers of, of our voice, of which we are going to talk all about. There's... Fry, modal, falsetto, and whistle. And I think we'll just leap right in there. We'll save vocal fry for the last because it sounds ridiculous and has also apparently caused a lot of controversy over the years. Mm. Let's start with whistling. Jessica, do you know or can you tell us what each of the four registers are? Well, you know, it's funny because I've never actually referred to them in that manner. So for the whistle tone, for whistle register... I've actually never been a huge proponent of that. It usually involves your vocal cords being stretched to the maximum limit and then pushing air through them, a very high rate of frequency. It's really not the greatest thing for you to do. I know that it can also be a result of possible damage of the cords, which is why your cords may not close properly, and thus you get a whistle because you try to force air through them, you try to force them to close, they stretch, they twist very tight. There's varying reasons for that. I've never been a huge fan of the whistle. Um, now, is the whistle the same? Is the whistle the same as you know what we think of saying an Andy Griffith walking down the street, put your lips together and blow, or is this a whistle more like a Elmer Fudd speech impediment 
kind of whistle to the vocal. This is more like Mariah Carey when you hear her sing high notes. Oh, wow. all I want for Christmas is that yeah. voice. When you, yeah, when you hear her sing those really crazy, and Ariana Grande, and there's a few others, when they do those really crazy high notes. Now, Mariah's case is interesting because she had a complete wonderful register from top to bottom when she started singing. Around 1999, I want to say, is when her voice actually started to give out. And some people believe it was due to overuse of the whistle register. She had a freaky ability to tap into it with uninjured cords. Now, I don't know if that's still the case. I don't know if she's had any surgery on them, but I don't want to speculate one way or another, uh, just because I don't want to be a bad colleague or anything. But it's, it's just interesting to note you can actually hear the vocal decline over the years. And there's a big hole in the middle of her voice. And I do believe that that's due to something, either, you know, a callus or a node, something that is preventing the vocal folds from closing properly so they don't vibrate the same way. So in order to get that whistle tone, she's got to stretch and, and, and elongate those cords even further. And, and I think there's a little bit of high, a little too high air pressure going against them. So I think that's what causes that whistle tone. That's why she still has her whistle register and not much else in the middle there. Yeah. Now, how similar is the whistle to the death growl, uh, usually heard most in heavy metal singing? Well, here's the funny thing about the death growl. The death growl actually comes from a totally different place, and it relates to vocal fry, believe it or not. Vocal fry is not the evil thing that everybody wants it to be. And my, my opinion on this is very controversial, but it comes from a very old school place. So I won't go too far into it, just because I know you want to save that for later. But the, the death growl actually comes from a place that I will talk about a little bit more I believe that William Bernard referred to it in his book as scrap stone. And I think I talked about that before. It's really a glottal scrape. And it's a scrapey feeling that you actually can feel against your chest, which we'll do more of later. But the idea is that it comes from a much lower placement. So you're not putting as much pressure on the vocal folds themselves. A lot of it comes from register, it comes from a lower onset, it comes from a different vibration in terms of the vocal folds, so you're not pushing air against them like you would for the whistle register. I think that what you're doing is you're actually, you may be grinding them together a little bit mm. though. Not the most healthy thing, but certainly a little bit healthier than doing a whistle register because you're a little more grounded in the sound, it's lower. It's, it's a bass level type of thing. And you're tapping into the low harmonic, which is the lowest part of the fundamental of the sound. So you're getting to like the bass line for everything. Go ahead. Is it a sound that you make while inhaling or do you make it through exhalation as well? I think you make it through exhalation. I've actually never tried it because I'm scared to death nice. of it. <laughs> but from, <laughs> but from, from what I gather and, and from what I know from my own experience and then teaching singers who do sing rock and roll and who do sing in the style of, let's say, Axl Rose or Sebastian Bach or one of, the, you know, one of these metal guys, it really does require a certain type of placement with the breath and the airflow. Mm. So you really do have to pay attention on the exhalation because it's a measured exhalation. And what you do with your larynx is you have to create a very, very large, wide space for it to happen, regardless. And that's pretty much how it is with no matter what you sing. Your larynx has to come down, and you've got to have a lot of space. And if you're really lucky, Praz, I will include on our Patreon page, if not in this episode, a brief clip of when I was in a death metal band of doing my own death growl with our group. And... and Jessica's right in that it does take a toll on. I think I may have seen that live. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have loved to see that live. That I, I would pay money to see that. That would it be. It was pretty amazing. Very special. It's yeah, death, very special. death metal, death metal, and palliative care. Those those two just go hand in hand. <laughs> the other registers. So we have the whistle, which is that very high pitched Mariah Carey the ah voice. Yes. And then we have the falsetto, which is... Oh, my favorite. I love the falsetto. It's so useful. And it's more useful than you would possibly even believe it to be. The falsetto is described in a couple different ways. Some people call it pure head voice. In women, falsetto is different than falsetto is for men. But it can be used the same in that what it does is it allows for your soft palate to go up. The falsetto also is the stimulation of the vocal cords to actually begin their stretch. Your retinoid cartilage in the back of your, of your larynx 
is what does all of this. The retinoids are my my favorite part of the voice because they're responsible for so much lovely action. Yay, I'm such a I nerd. also love the retinoids. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Trust me. <laughs> Yay, retinoids. So when your retinoid cartilage is stretching and to get a really good falsetto, and you guys can do this and everybody can do this at home because it's really fun. And we talked about this last time with the Mrs. Doubtfire voice. No, no, no. Yes. So, pay attention to how you feel when you do that because what happens is your your soft palate goes up and you can actually start to feel your your constrictor muscles in the back of your neck. They will begin to stretch. And so that's why I find falsetto to be such a wonderful thing because the more you do it, the more you get used to it, it can be really, it just feels really good. And you can use it to color all sorts of things. And unfortunately, it's very late here in my condo and I can't sing it full voice. Um, but I would actually, I wish I could demonstrate for you what it can do because if you add falsetto to a specific, let's say you're singing a song and you want it to have a little bit more depth you want to you want to bring out more of the harmonic spectrum in the sound and harmonics are those wonderful overtones and things that give you chills and when you hear a really good singer you know exactly what i'm talking about you hear a good singer and they give you goosebumps and you just hear all these wonderful things surrounding you and those are the harmonics and the a really good singer should be able to produce about 12 harmonics in the sound mm. an average singer about eight where and does Taylor Swift fall? I have no idea because I've never heard her live. How about Adele? Anybody's ever heard her live. <laughs> I'm going to probably say Taylor Swift is hovering around eight to nine, but that's because I'm not a huge fan. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I know. I'm not a fan of the Tay-Tay. Sorry. <laughs> but, and and um, what about Adele? Adele, it's, you know, Adele has some interesting issues of her own um, because, you know, Adele had, had that vocal hemorrhage issue right. a few years back. And Adele's issues stem from her breath control. Most of what happens with Adele is that she gets some really good onset, but then she ends up pushing her airflow a little too high against her vocal cords, and she actually doesn't use falsetto. You can use falsetto when you're singing in chest voice because all it is is that wonderful stretch in the back, and you can add that to all sorts of things. So she really doesn't take advantage of the space. So she kind of does what we call singing out the mask, which is singing out the front of your face, which is really not a good thing to mm. do. Um, but you try to push all the sound out the front of your nose. In theory, people say, oh, it's going to sound brighter and it's going to sound more clear. The problem is, is that your larynx will also go up because it's not really related to anything that involves proper onset or proper breath control or anything. So your larynx can rise and then it just basically sounds like you're singing up your nose. And yeah, so don't sing out your face. You no, know, you don't sing out your face. Here's the weird part of that, though. The... I think I talked about this last time. We have these valvular functions of the larynx, which are all your resonances and all the cool things. Like, for example, falsetto is one of them. And you can feel falsetto in several places around. You can feel the buzz. You can feel it in your forehead. You can feel it behind your head, your occipital bone. You can feel it in the base of your neck around your seventh cervical vertebra. So, I mean, there's varying places you can feel that vibration. What you can do is you can quack things. But I usually tell my students if they're going to quack, if they want to feel that sympathetic vibration in their nose or in the front of their face, they can certainly feel that. But they have to remember that the sound actually has to travel backwards and down, almost like it's going in, in a, um, the beginnings of like a Nautilus shell, if you will. So what I usually have my students do is I have them hold their nose and quack. It'll go quack, and it goes backward as opposed to falling forward into the face. Go ahead and try that out at home, listeners. Yeah. We'll wait a moment. Quack. <laughs> Everybody quack. Quack. <laughs> now I want to go out and buy car insurance. Yeah, yeah exactly. But it's, it's an interesting thing because what we think of as resonance and where we talk about placing the sound, it's really more about a sympathetic vibration that we're feeling in our head as it relates to how our vocal cords are stretching and twisting and doing all the cool gymnastics that they do. So when you create a voice, let's say you're a fantastic voiceover artist and you have 101 different voices and you all, and they all do different things, really what that artist is relying on is the sympathetic vibrations that he or she is feeling in relation to what they're doing in their larynx. So that's whistle and falsetto. Then we reach the most common method of the voice register, which is modal and it's modal because it is the most common. If you think back to when you were in 
uh, grade school or high school, you learned about the mean, median, and mode, with the mode being the most frequently appearing. So that's where we get the name modal voice. And what is in the modal voice register, Jess? Well, it's funny because I have never heard that term before. Hmm. Really? <laughs> I'm assuming you're referring to just basic speech. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The basic speech actually does take on several different things depending on how big your larynx is, what's your face shape like, what, how long is your neck, which is why, I mean, obviously everybody has a different voice and a different timbre, and it really is just the characteristic of, of you. So, for example, even in, in uh, Dr. Abathol's book, he talks about a woman who comes in who has a very husky sounding voice and she wants an operation because there was some nodes or something in the vocal cords that were giving her that huskiness and she thought she sounded too manly and she wanted a change so he did a little laser surgery on her and then it turned out that she was a soprano when everything was all fixed and she hated it and he actually asked her later on to possibly start smoking one to two cigarettes a day to bring back some of the edema or swelling in the cords so that she'd have a little bit huskier tone to get the sound that she was used to and comfortable with that made it unique for her. I do not recommend you all smoking <laughs> to get the sound you want, though. Cannot stress that enough. However, I think in that case, it was sort of it was one of those warranted things where she was going to have a psychotic break if she didn't. It's just interesting because that modal sound, I think, is, is what makes us individuals. It's, it's very different. The one thing I will say is that some people speak more clearly than others. Some people have a better sense of their own airflow. They speak, as we say, on the breath. Here's something you all can do, and this is actually going to relate to the vocal fry as well. Uh, if you, let's say you try to speak and you can't, like, like try to imitate that. When you try to speak and you can't, kind of feel like your larynx tips forward a little bit. Like if you're stuttering or? No, no, literally, like, like open your mouth and pretend like your, your vocal cords are going to come together. You're going to try to speak and nothing comes out. Lip, yeah. lip sync. I got you. Because when you do lip sync, your, your, uh, your vocal, if, if you, if you really know what you're doing and you start lip syncing, sometimes your your larynx will tip forward like you're going to begin to sing. You definitely can hear when somebody is speaking on the breath if their voice is very clear, doesn't have a lot of you know breathy sounds in there or any weird breaks or anything like that. Usually somebody like that. And I mean, most of the time we do speak on the breath. Sometimes it's considered too loud to a lot of people. I know especially women have this issue we are often told oh it's it's not ladylike to to speak that loudly things like that and so we're often made to hush so you will see a lot of women who over time develop issues because they end up doing what i call speaking off their voice which is when they don't use proper air support and everything gets very breathy and it's very soft hmm the Zoe Deschanel voice, which we will get into. So that's what we've learned kind of about modal voice. It's just that is the most common register. That is the way you, you out there in listening land, actually speak. And the sound of your voice is unique, not only because you're a delicate little snowflake, but also because of the shape and size of your vocal cords. So as we learned, removing nodes from your throat can change the sound of your voice, but even do just the size and shape of the person's body. So that's why, you know, we, we laugh, but there does exist what we stereotypically think of as a fat voice or a thin voice. And certain body types will, in fact, lend themselves to vocal registers. And losing or gaining weight can affect how your voice sounds. Oh, big time. A lot of that, again, has to do with the airflow issues. When you lose, and I, I am a candidate for this, I lost about 35 pounds and had to go massively into training my voice. It was it was Olympic level training to get everything back to where it was. Because what happens is when you lose that mass, especially around your rib cage, in your diaphragm area, in, in your transverse abdominis, basically your entire torso, you have to learn how to breathe. What happens is when somebody has extra girth, they can actually breathe a lot more efficiently. It takes less air for them to make a good sound. And there's a wonderful case study. There's a woman named Deborah Voigt who was very, very, very overweight, and she ended up having gastric bypass. And consequently, after she lost, I think she lost over 100 pounds, she ended up having some major vocal issues. 
and most of them were not tied to her vocal cords specifically. They were tied to her ability to breathe properly and efficiently. And it's something that not everybody thinks about because you think, oh, I breathe, I expand my ribs, okay, I support the tone, I, I get my epigastrium working there, I, I, I hold myself up with transverse abdominis and my psoas is working and everything's great. But the thing is, is that you don't really feel it until you've lost a ton of weight and it's not there and you don't have any fat supporting you. So you have to do extra work to be able to hold yourself up, to be able to support a tone. It's very, very tricky. And it's something that uh, a lot of people struggle with uh, when they when they go up and down weight wise. So it's, it's an issue that I've seen. I have a lot of friends who have experienced it. I've experienced it. And it's, it's a big deal. You could use definitely a vocal bra because it sounds like <laughs> singing ability is a muscle and subject to a use it or lose it effect. So well, if you don't have something the, supporting... Well, back in the day, a lot of the big stars of the early, early 20th century wore corsets, both men and women. They were known for wearing corsets on stage when they sang because they needed something to help them get some resistance going with their breath. So that way they could, you know, kind of sing against something and, and create the sound they were looking for. I guess along those lines, if somebody's overweight and they have a bigger girth around their neck, for example, something that we mm-hmm. or I specifically in the operating room worry about because that big mess, that big mass around the neck can compress the airway. Is that that sort of mm-hmm. airway resistance you're talking about that could actually help them with their voice and make their breathing more efficient? Mm-hmm. Sometimes, yes. I think it really depends on how much girth around the neck we're talking about. Because there are some people who I have met who aren't overweight who have, like, no neck. Uh-huh. <laughs> and they're fabulous singers. They usually sing really, really big German repertoire. <laughs> Most of them are built like linebackers. They are very square. I think it really depends on the individual, their training, exactly what the measurements of the neck are. So we've learned about a couple different options, and again, we have our whistle or Mariah Carey voice, our falsetto or our Mrs. Doubtfire voice, our modal or just our normal voice, yodeling, which we won't go into too much today, we did cover on the last voice episode, is basically just a vocal manipulation where you alternate between your falsetto and your low notes. Mm -hmm. Uh, go Go ahead and try that at home, have some fun with it alternate between doing Mrs. Doubtfire and as deep as you can go and then do it fast and that or, is your or, own unique or just go Auga, Auga. <laughs> <laughs> so right before we get to what things about your voice can tell you about your health which we've already started to let's talk about vocal fry um, uh, not vocal shake not vocal double double yes so, you cannot get them well done <laughs> Not in and out. <laughs> so, so tell us about these throat potatoes. Well, I have to kind of go back a little bit here, and I have to get my, my handy-dandy book out because it's I have to read this to you. When we talk about vocal fry, a lot of people are talking about it in terms of speech, which you probably really shouldn't do. And we all did it as kids. Vocal fry is essentially when you were a kid and you discovered you could go, uh, that's vocal fry. That cracking, bubble-popping sound. Like when you try to burp on purpose. And in fact, they call it a pop of the glottis. However, there are many different types of glottal shock. The most common one, well, actually, there's two common ones. One I talked about earlier, the sneeze, when you get two. The other one being a cough. Now, coughing is the wrong type of glottal shock because it can be very violent, voluntary, It's it doesn't feel good. The interesting thing about vocal fry is that it is a scrapey feeling that actually can be quite useful when done in the proper setting and with the right airflow. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. You just have to know how to use it. Now, if it were really that bad, all of us would have the worst, most shredded vocal cords on the planet because we all did that as kids. Uh, are you sure? <laughs> I, I don't think I did. <laughs> the thing is, is that what, what what it became popular with women who wanted to sound more authoritative because it was a lower pitch. They were tapping into the low harmonic of the fundamental of the sound, which you know can be a, the intention is good. I totally get it. The low harmonic will give you some uh, uh, authority to your voice, especially if you're in a situation where you need that. 
The problem is when you don't support it, it just sounds like this. And it's really annoying. The Katy Perry voice. Exactly. Mm. And it's funny because Katy Perry uses it when she sings and it sounds great. Yeah, the thing about this is that the, the scrape of the glottis, as it will, that's what they call it here, the sensation of glottic action, it comes from that, that low place where you actually can feel it. If you put your hand on your chest and do it, you can feel your chest vibrate. However, when you do it, you, you can't you can't initiate it with any sort of breathiness in the sound. Otherwise, all it's going to do is just grind your vocal cords together. It's not going to do you any good. However, if you were to use it properly, let's say I was about to sing something and I needed to make sure that my chords were coming together, but they weren't overclosing. I would actually, and I do this exercise with my students, and we start on a gentle ah. In fact, um, I usually use the words angry hangman to get that ah feeling, because you can say, if you say a low ah, yeah. that's, yeah, ah, that's essentially where vocal fry is. But what we're doing is we're adding another vowel onto it, and we're, we're supporting the tone with a little bit more um, proper airflow. So if I'm starting an exercise, I would actually have the student go ah, 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 or I would have them go, ee, ee, ee. just a very gentle little tiny, 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 we call it a glottal stop sometimes as well. And you can feel it in your, in your larynx when you do it. You can actually feel that gentle coming together of your vocal pull. As long as you don't put any excess pressure on it, or as long, you have to keep the pressure like a medium of, of the airflow in there. So you can't have too little, you can't have too much. It's got to sort of be right smack in the middle. And a good way to test this, actually, and, I, and do you remember how we were talking about the yodel exercise? If we did a slow version of that, where we started at and then went all the way up into yodel, in order for you to do it seamlessly without having a break in the, in the sound, because sometimes what will happen is you go, and there will be a slight break in there. To do it without a break requires you to have a perfect balance of airflow. It's actually a lot harder than it sounds, isn't it? Oh, yes, because it requires a hefty amount of concentration. Now, the controversy is that you are correct in that women take a lot of heat for speaking with vocal fry. In singing, it is one thing. In speaking, mm -hmm. uh, women who are using vocal fry in their daily speech, and again, when you're thinking about that, Think of Katy Perry. Think of Zoe De Chanel. Mm -hmm. Think of women who have kind of that low, yeah. breathy, dive bar sort mm -hmm. of almost but not quite sexy time voice. Mm -hmm. And that is vocal fry, and that is viewed by many without justification to perceive somebody who has it as sounding less trustworthy, less competent, less hireable. And this is, you know, any woman who. Now, men also do this, but we don't take any kind of fact for it. I'll give you the biggest example. Almost every male country singer that uses mm -hmm. vocal fry at the beginning of any, fr you know, they took my dog, yeah, well, that's my good. wife. <laughs> Glottal stop. We actually call that, and, and again, I, we call it uh, scrap snung because it really is a scrapey feeling right against your chest. You can literally feel it right against your chest. Now, it's interesting to note that some of the greatest singers that ever lived swore by that because that meant that they felt like they were hooked up. And so that's why I'm talking about why, why, why the breath control is so important. Now, I've actually been talking to you in an area, my voice actually sort of rests in that lowered glottal region anyway. I was born with a larynx that was actually very low from the get-go, <laughs> and it just sort of stayed there. And so because my larynx is just naturally positioned low, I tend to speak in that area, but I always make sure that it's a supported sound so I never start sounding like this. That's um, right. You yeah. don't want to sound like the girls on Broad City. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that does get into up talk, which is what we all think of as the valley girl oh, sort of speech. Now, I here's a fun, <laughs> few fun facts about the voice. The average normal speaking pitch for women is the G below middle C. So for those of you who are musical nerds, most women tend to fall into that G range. And for men, it's the C below middle C. So go to a keyboard, hit that middle key. That should be a C. Sing along with it. Now drop a full octave lower. That's most men. And drop to about, what, 
three, four notes down, and that is most women. Mm -hmm. uh, now, most men can sustain a sound, any sound, take your pick, for about 20 seconds, whereas women can only do it for 15 seconds and children for 10 seconds. That means men literally are the best at whining. If we come up with a sound, I can do this. A whole 20 seconds if I really wanted to. And a shorter maximum phonation time, or MPT, or an inability for me to stretch it out to 20 seconds, would show an inefficiency of the respiratory system, because breathing, along with your flapping vocal cords, is a large part of talking. And that's because the voice works in three parts. You have the power source, which is mm -hmm. breath, the vibration source, which is your vocal folds, mm -hmm. and the amplification, which are little spaces in your throat, mouth, and nose that help to regulate that airflow and adjust the pitch or frequency. Right, but you never want to actually imagine that you're placing the sound there. The, that amplification and the resonation that you have is a sympathetic vibration. You always have to remember it's a sympathetic vibration. It is not based in actual reality, believe it or not. <laughs> so now that we've learned about the four voice registers, let's talk, talk a little bit about what your voice can tell you about your health. Now, one of the things we always are on the lookout for as doctors is a sudden abrupt change in the way of speaking. Now, Praz, I know most of your patients come to you unconscious, <laughs> but as an anesthesiologist and somebody who has to intubate people, do you ever notice abrupt changes post-surgically from their voice, either as a result of the gas or the procedures performed? Oh, oh, all the time, I can say. Um, so to clarify, they actually come to me awake and then I knock them out <laughs> and then make their wildest dreams come true for about 45 to 50 minutes and then bring them back. Yeah, once we pull out their breathing tube, the tone of their voice can actually give us a very good example of, of how they're doing. Just today, earlier today, I had a patient who had a very serious condition called laryngospasm. Basically, it's a condition where your vocal cords are shut tight and won't open up. When you hear that lower diameter of vocal cords, it causes a lot of very high-pitched, squealish type noises, commonly referred to as strider, as opposed to the patient's normal voice before surgery. And... When I could hear that my patient wasn't able to speak in their normal tone and that they instead had those high-pitched squeals going through, something that alerted us that something was very seriously wrong and that we needed to fix it. Praz, have you ever had anyone come to you and request a specific size of intubation too? Actually, I have. Occasionally, I've had patients who are professional singers who actually requested smaller tubes because they were concerned about vocal cord trauma. Because it does happen, and it's actually all of our biggest fear. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, in those cases, we make it a little bit of an extra point to do what we can, try to minimize that. We can use a smaller tube. The risk being that if you use a smaller diameter tube, then it doesn't occlude the entire trachea. And the whole point of the tube, in addition to helping them breathe, is to prevent air from leaking out, to prevent other substances like saliva from leaking down the throat and causing aspiration. Typically, we try not to do it, but occasionally with those patients, like you mentioned, we may go a little bit smaller to try to prevent trauma. Mm -hmm. How dare you, sir, bringing me a size three? My throat is a size two at best. <laughs> <laughs> what are you insinuating? I'm like, look, man, I saw you had no neck. I got you the big th throat too. <laughs> size doesn't matter. It's what you do with it. <laughs> See, ladies and gentlemen, it's all about the throat too. <laughs> so, there you go. You can always request your own throat tube fitting, but leave it to the professionals to figure out. So there are a couple of other things your voice can tell you about your health. Uh, what if you have a croaky voice that is new to you, and you're not Katy Perry or Zoe Deschanel or doing intentional vocal fry? Well, a croaky voice, especially in the morning may seem characteristic of waking up out of bed, it can also be a sign of acid reflux. Mm -hmm. So the recurring motion of stomach acid from the stomach back into the esophagus can also reach the larynx and throat. 
any kind of acid irritation to the larynx can cause a hoarse voice as the vocal folds begin to swell from the irritation and that means they don't vibrate as well. So you basically have your stomach acid landing on your voice box, making it all swollen and puffy. That it means hurts. two vocal cords. Yeah, somebody likened it to putting your vocal cords in a vat of domestic bleach. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't do that, no. Now, the head cold voice, which I think is best exemplified as either the way Millhouse talks, or if you know that old song, Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, where the woman sounds like she has a stuffed nose, that rockin' around the Christmas tree. That's the head cold voice. Technical terms, of course. Of course. Now, the common cold is the most obvious cause of this, and it can produce what you think is an unflattering tone. It's more a nasal, a lack of nasal airflow or a muffle congested quality. So if air can't pass through the nasal passages, you could lead the quality of the voice to be very different since our tone of voice resonates in our nose and sinuses. Mm -hmm. So people who have this permanent voice can have chronically inflamed sinuses due to infection or allergy. Uh, sometimes they can get nasal polyps, which will block the sinuses. Or you could just be in the midst of having a cold. So if you do notice these kind of changes in your voices, these are some of the health things to look for. Last, but certainly not least, is a deeper voice. Now, patients who have thyroid problems can hear a weakening of their voice quality. Jessica, you mentioned nodes earlier, swollen nodes, or a growth on the thyroid like, the, like a goiter. The thyroid is right next to the laryngeal nerve, the nerve that carries all the information from your voice box and neck up to your brain. Node on the thyroid or damage to the laryngeal nerve could result in paralysis of your vocal cords, meaning only one of those two can high-five the other. The other one's just sort of standing there being very passive. Thyroid or endocrine problems can also result in changes in pitch, meaning if you're thin and you get a very heavy voice or if you're husky, and you get a mini mouse type voice. People with thyroid cancer may have the nerve destroyed, which can lead to only one vocal cord able to move, and again, a very whispery, hoarse voice. So if you notice any abrupt changes in your method of speaking, this is things you should watch for. One other thing I want to talk on is, I'm sure some of you have wondered at some point in your life, how come your voice sounds different on a recording? Uh, yes, oh you God, yes. They hate it. Bone conduction. <laughs> there you go. Bone conduction. So, Proz, as somebody who maybe is not a fan of the way they sound on recording versus live, because I find you have a simply mellifluous voice in oh, the real course. world. Of course, isn't everybody? The first thing most people hear is vibrating sound waves hitting your eardrum. That's the way other people hear your voice. The second way people hear is vibrations inside your skull set off by your vocal cords. In a way, some of us, everyone on this planet is empty-headed a little bit. Our vocal cords will vibrate, those sound waves will travel around, ricochet off the inside of our skull, and hit our own eardrums. But other people, the voice goes directly into their eardrums without rattling around in the skull first. Mm. So, when you speak, your vibrations from your own vocal cords travel up through your bony skull and set the eardrum vibrating. Think of it from the inside out. As they travel through the bone, they spread out and they lower in pitch, which gives you a false sense of bass or deepening. So when you hear a recording of your own voice, it's not rattling around from your vocal cords up to your skull to your ears. You're getting it directly from the recording to your ears. So every time you hear yourself on a recording, your voice sounds more high-pitched. One other fun fact I'd like to share with you, and then we will close out with a little bit of history. Jessica, were you aware that the voice can be used as a breathalyzer? No, I was unaware of this. And now I'm, I'm horrified. No. <laughs> <laughs> people are going to know that I've had that bottle of wine. I mean, oh, dear. People can certainly sound drunk, that's for sure. <laughs> Proz, you are partially correct. But using the voice as a breathalyzer is not just a simple m a matter of identifying, take me drunk, Ossifer, I'm home. <laughs> Took the words no, right out of my mouth. <laughs> there are different speech patterns or styles of regulating breath that I'm sure you know about. And I've learned partially because my mother is a speech pathologist. Oh, yeah. And 
and very talented at identifying multiple things, meaning, of course, I couldn't sniff anything by her growing up. <laughs> Jitter and shimmer. And these are ways of regulating airflow. These are styles of speech. And it turns out drunk people tend to exhibit a statistically significant higher jitter and shimmer in their speech. Now, there are ways that you can identify this, and I encourage you to go ahead and look up jitter and shimmer in speech. And they're measures of the cycle-to-cycle variations of frequency and amplitude in your voice. So people who have a very high jitter to their speech, and unfortunately you're going to have to wait until I can get my mom to speak on this to learn what those features are, because I'm not going to teach you how to sound less drunk right before the holidays. (laughs) With people who are trained professionals, you can actually identify just from the way people are speaking, whether or not they're slurring, how drunk they are, because your pitch and frequency will change depending on the amount of intake or intoxicants you have imbibed. Last thing I want to talk about, and this one is just for me, folks, is perhaps you know occasionally we go into what we call the old-timey news radio announcer voice. Well, that has a name, and it's known as the transatlantic accent. Of course, linguists use the term rotico to describe whether a person pronounces or doesn't pronounce the R before a consonant sound at the end of the word. That's mostly what the transatlantic accent is, taking the R's out. If you think about it, when we announce, oh my gosh, new president Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Some of those R's almost start getting dropped. Well, of course, the first thing we think of, if I tell you what famous accent does something with its R's, where are you going to come up with? Hmm. Uh, Boston, maybe? mm -hmm. Or Long Island. Or Long Island. I was going to say British, but I'm way off, but that's a whole other subject. So (laughs) if I give you a phrase, I parked my car in Harvard Yard, how would you say that? I guess, as a British person, Jessica. Oh, you're going to make me do this? I am. <laughs> I parked my car in Harvard Yard. Okay, and Pros, why don't you give me a Boston accent? A Boston accent? <laughs> I parked my car in Harvard Yard. In both of those, if you say it in like a vaudeville version, leaving all those R's out, you're non rhotic if you say it with all the R's in, you're being rhotic. The idea is that the fewer the R's, the fancier the person. Really? Queen Elizabeth doesn't say she parked her car. She would say, I parked my car. And neither did Franklin Roosevelt, nor did any of the newsreel announcers or movie actors of the day. However, and, and <laughs> neither did, well... That's that, I'm thing. glad I'm glad you brought bring it up because the prestige marker flipped after World War II. So prior to World War II, only the fancy pants, hoi polloi, posh people were leaving the R's out. Queen Elizabeth was not saying, I parked my car. But you're right. Now it's Snooky, because in post World War II, fancy people started pronouncing the R's and recovering them. And Lower class people, not meaning uneducated, but meaning not from those fancy posh positions, were the ones who started dropping their R's. And that is when we get Snooky parking her car. Yeah, that's the accent I grew up with my entire life. Now you know the transatlantic accent is described as rotico and used to be associated because in order to pronounce very well for speech stage and screen and indicative of a high level of education, you would drop that R at the end. But post-World War II, we all started picking it up again as part of education and diction and enunciation training, whereas everyone else said, ah, forget this, it's too hard. So one of the reasons for that old-timey news radio announcer voice was the rhotic R known as the transatlantic accent. The other, of course, being primitive microphone technology. Natural voices would not get picked up well by microphones of the time and people were therefore instructed to learn and speak in such a way that their words could best be transmitted through the microphone to radio waves or recording media with the proper amount of pauses and leaving off of unnecessary consonants and vowels at the end. <laughs> and oh I could talk like that all day long. <laughs> but, right. no one would allow me. but we sadly don't have the time for that, <laughs> which brings us the end of this particular episode on the voice, vocal fry, 
and all the fun things we can do with talking. Now, last time, Jess, you gave us a few different vocal exercises. You could tell us where to travel in New York right now, if there's any fancy oh. places people should check out or any recent vacations you've been on for our Just the Tip, and maybe a good vocal exercise to do on the way there since the weather outside is frightful. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> there's plenty of plenty of exercises one can do, um, especially when it's really cold out. Like today I was at an audition and we were all freezing walking in the door and it was just it was brutal. One thing that I learned recently, especially when you want to get the falsetto working really quickly, and this is something that, that we've been doing around New York lately, and I, I know I know a couple of people who've been seeing Carnegie Hall lately who have been doing this. And we, we like to say we're imitating a small dog, preferably a chihuahua, going... <laughs> <laughs> and what what part of your voice does barking like a small chihuahua uh, strengthen? Two parts, actually. It strengthens both the front tight part, which is partially that vocal fry, the little bit of the resonator that comes around your nose, and then it also it uh, stimulates the back portion, which is the uh, the big part of the resonator, the big part of the sound, which is the falsetto, and um, I also like to call that, there's, there's a little thing there, I call it the hollow whoo, which is whoo, I call it the ghost. In fact, if you want to have a really fun time, reach your hand around the back of your neck, right by your seventh vertebra, and say a very loud whoo, like you were an owl. See, we do whoo, whoo, animals here. Whoo, whoo, whoo. You feel a little vibration down there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, that is something we use in classical technique a lot. And what that does is it allows you to tap into not only that falsetto range, but also gets those those constrictor muscles in the back of your neck to stretch out, which is very hel helpful because when you are in cold weather, like it has been, the first thing that happens to you, even if you're wearing a scarf and you're wearing a huge parka like I was, is your neck muscles because you, your shoulders start to round and then your neck starts to squish down because it just gets so cold and you start shivering and it's horrible and it can wreak all sorts of havoc when you're trying to sing, when you're trying to make pretty sounds. So the best thing is when, you, when you're in the cold and, and you need to get warm fast. And actually, um, the great singer Pavarotti, who we all knew and loved as one of the three tenors, he was nutso about this. Apparently, he had the hair trigger mechanism on his uh, constrictors in his neck because he would walk around wearing a scarf even when it was 85 degrees outside. All right. And last but not least, now that we know it's yap like chihuahuas and hoot like owls. Mm -hmm. Jessica, what is our just the tip with a winter destination? Where is somewhere that you want to send people with this terrible, terrible weather that they absolutely need to see? Ooh, I was going to say Montreal. <laughs> Mon cold as it is, it's so pretty. And come on, maple syrup on snow. I mean, it just sounds like the greatest thing ever, right? Maple syrup? You know, yes, they take no. No, so, don't eat no. Don't <laughs> eat fresh snow. It don't delicious. eat yellow snow. Carol, no, it's not coming from the ground. It's the snow, but it's a treat there. And you go and you get fresh maple syrup put on snow, and it, and it's wonderful. And I mean, if, if you're going to go out to a cold destination, Montreal is certainly one of the prettiest places I could think of to go. I mean, all like, right. So where are you getting this maple snow if not from off the ground? Um, there are various places you can go. I know there's a couple places in Quebec City you can go. Um, I haven't actually, I don't have the list in front of me here. It's a thing. Trust me, it's a thing. <laughs> All right, so go get Maple Snow and Tim Hortons. As always, we love to hear your comments, questions, and feedback. You can reach us on Facebook, on Squarespace, on Twitter, on Patreon, anywhere podcasts are downloaded. We'd love to hear your reviews, your ratings. And we would love for you to support us spiritually, emotionally, and financially. Included in the show notes are a whole bunch of places you can do that. Our theme music is composed by Rachel Leisure. This show is produced by me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me help. With a lot of help from all my co-hosts and those of you who submit stories. Thank you very much. And until next time, as always, happy travels. Bye, guys. Happy travels. Happy travels.